We're going to do a couple things today. I'm going to start and, and talk a little bit, kind of a continuation of what we did yesterday. And then um, at some point when they get here, and, you know, after I've kind of finished my, my spiel, um, we'll have uh, our two guests take over, and I'll introduce them at that point. Um, to kind of briefly recap what we did yesterday, we talked a little bit about the origins of kind of protests and radical movements in the U.S. And I went through it fairly quickly. Um, what you saw, I think, for the most part, at the beginning of colonial America and, and in the early years of the Republic, was that these movements generally uh, organized around agricultural issues and issues of, of things like taxes and debt. So they were, they were economic issues, they were class-based issues, but often um, the protests <coughs> were organized and conducted by farmers. Uh, acting on behalf of their own interest in what they thought was kind of what they called a moral economy. This was uh, a couple things I didn't mention. Uh, um, protests like this were really prevalent around the time of the War for Independence in the 1770s too. A lot of merchants who were associated with the British were charging you know, pretty high prices. So it wasn't unusual for groups to go to the, the granary or the, the bread store or whatever and simply take what they needed and leave what they thought was a fair price. They called this setting the price. There's a great account from Abigail Adams. It's probably the, the people who are supposed to be here. No, it's not. <laughs> Sorry about that. I told him I'd leave the phone on. Um, there's a great account from uh, Abigail Adams, John Adams' wife. After the Boston Tea Party, uh, she talked about something that they called a coffee party. There was a, uh, a coffee merchant who was selling his coffee at prices they considered unfair, so they went into the the warehouse, and they they actually like physically assaulted this guy. They put him in a wheelbarrow and tipped him out, and they took the coffee, right? So that kind of stuff is, is kind of prevalent, and again, it's based on these kind of economic interests. I haven't talked much about labor. I'll start doing that a lot more today. It, when you talk about protest, if you look at the kind of traditional model, generally it's going to revolve around working people, the working classes, and, and labor. Um, if you follow kind of a traditional Marxist view, that would be the way that he would see it organized, the, the, the proletariat. Well, you don't really have an industrial working class yet, and, and you're going to see that in the post-Civil War era. Um, you do have labor issues, and I, I didn't have it up here, but it, it's worth mentioning. Um, you do have labor issues, though, uh, around the, this period of, of uh, the Jacksonian era, at the time of Doors Rebellion and these other rebellions. You start to see workers begin to organize collectively and act in, in concert with one another. Um, most unions in the United States, there really weren't, they, it, it's hard to call them unions. Most organization among workers in the earliest years of the Republic occurred among skilled workers, right? Um, somebody who has a trade, somebody, a, a plumber or a tailor or a furniture maker, someone who has a skill uh, and they organize collectively, mostly in like guilds rather than unions. And they would require certain working conditions and, and material conditions and things like that. Um, unskilled workers, uh, first of all, most people are still farming anyway, but unskilled workers are going to take another century to organize. Skilled workers obviously have a real advantage. Just they have a skill. They can't be easily replaced. So as, as a, 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 um, you know, a boss, I can't replace a bunch of tailors or, or plumbers or something like that. So you guys have skills, which means you can organize and, and you have actually more leverage in a negotiation. Unskilled workers don't. And so that's when you're going to start really seeing um, far more aggressive protest movements and far more aggressive uh, confrontations between capital and, and labor. Uh, workers in unskilled uh, uh, jobs and unskilled occupations, factory workers, things like that, mill workers. Textiles comes to the U.S. early. That's kind of the first industrialization comes in the textile industry in the early, late 1700s, early 1800s, especially in New England. And workers in those industries um, will really become kind of the first uh, 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 industrial proletariat in the U.S. And you're going to see a whole lot of, of aggressive labor confrontation in those industries where um, they're really badly paid. They're paid like a dollar you know, a day, uh, really not a living wage. Um, you have a lot of child labor, a lot of children are working. And um, so what, what these workers will often try to do is organize as a group, um, and it's harder for them to do because they're very easily replaced. You know, there's just a ton of uh, unemployed people out there. So if you don't keep your job, it's, you know, there's somebody else who will come in and take it fairly quickly. Um, 
And so they try to organize unions. They try to organize across trades lines, like in, in big unions. So, like you might organize as uh, cigar makers, or you know, a newspaper plant, or something like that. Uh, and then what they'll try to do is organize across those lines. So the cigar makers in the union and the newspaper workers might try to organize together. And actually, in the 1830s and 40s, there was an attempt to create a national union, the NUL, the national. I'm sorry, the NLU, the National Labor Union. Um, these really didn't stick. It was hard, again, because the workers involved didn't have much economic clout. It was fairly easy to suddenly get rid of them or challenge them. And in addition to that, it's kind of like when we talked about colonial Virginia with Bacon's Rebellion or you know, colonial South Carolina. The people who uh, ran the manufactories in, in the banks in the north had the same kind of political clout. So they would simply go to court. Uh, courts, uh, uh, in fact, one union, they... they um, they held one union in contempt for trying to have a strike because they were uh, conspiring to get better wages. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's what unions do, right? They try to get better wages for their workers. And they went to court and they were, they were found guilty of conspiracy because they were working together. And what kind of system is the U.S.? It's a free labor system and a free market system. And those are the words often used, free labor and free market. You know, my, my running joke is that... Uh, uh, free labor and free markets are like free love. There ain't no such thing, you know? Um, so, uh, uh, um, in, in this system, ideally, theoretically, in this utopian ideal, uh, people would negotiate individually. It's a free system. So, if I'm the boss, each of you would individually negotiate with me, and you're free to contract with me. You're free to negotiate, so I could give you twice the wages I give him, even though you're doing the exact same job. Although, given your gender roles, he would obviously get twice what you get, right? It's just the way it is. God wanted it that way, according to, to uh, early American manufacturers and, and Pat Robertson. Um, and then, you know, I, I, you would all contract. And if you got, you know, mouthy with me, I'd just fire you. You got lippy with me. If any of you, you didn't come back from lunch on time, you got sick and you took a few days off, I could fire you. It's a free labor system. That's the idea behind it. It's free labor. So there's no obligation on either part. Now, the irony is that uh, a lot of Southerners will look at this and say, you know, that's actually more exploited than slavery. So there's this actual, Northerners start to, to, to call themselves wage slaves for this reason. The ideology uh, of, of free labor is attacked basically with the same ideas that the, the, the actual slave system in the South is attacked. Um, workers will say, uh, 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 I mean, there's actually a, an economic theory that suggests that capitalism is, is more exploited. This wage labor system is more exploited. There's a, uh, a movie called Bird, uh, Marlon Brando's, and it's actually kind of a, 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 about the Haitian Revolution. But Brando's a merchant, and he's explaining the difference between capitalism, free trade, free labor, and slavery. And he actually uses the, uh, the analogy of uh, uh, marriage versus prostitution. And he suggests that you know, when you marry somebody, you've got to buy her mink coats and take her on vacations and all that kind of stuff. Whereas prostitution, you kind of pay somebody and they leave. And that was kind of his entry. Hey, hey. We'll, uh, have a seat and we'll, we'll get going. Yeah, I'm just doing a little bit of background. Uh, the idea there was that capitalism is actually more exploited because you, and, and more effective. It's, it's a better way, it's a better profit, it's a more profitable system. Because in capitalism, you'll pay these workers, basically, you'll buy their labor for 12 or 14 hours a day. And then they're gone, and your obligation to them is gone. You're paying them to work and leave. Whereas with slavery, you have this significant initial investment. I mean, a slave might cost you $1,500. Um, and then you have to minimally keep up. You know, you have to give them a place to live. You have to give them some food. You have to give them rudimentary health care. So there's a persistent investment and a persistent cost involved. Whereas with wage labor, you don't. If a slave gets sick, it's in your interest to make sure that slave gets back to health because you have this initial investment, which is quite sizable. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's an investment. It's chattel. It's property. Whereas with wage labor, if you get sick, I don't really care because I'll just hire somebody else to take your place. All right? Now, this is not in any way a moral endorsement of, of slavery. You know, I, I shouldn't even have to say that. But um, the point is, this is, this is part of that, the ideology. And a lot of, um, a lot of northern wage workers actually adopt that, and they start to call themselves wage slaves. And this is when you see attempts in the early 1800s to start to organize collectively. The idea behind unionization is that the free labor system can't work uh, on an individual basis. The, the power differential is too great. I mean, as a worker, how can you go in 
and negotiate equally with the guy who owns the plant or the guy who owns the textile mill. You can't. Because the textile owner obviously has significant amounts of capital, he has the banks behind him, he has the political system behind him. You go in individually, you can't compete against that. So if you say I want better wages or I want, you know, next week off, I need, I need, you know, I need some time off to, to go find myself or something like that. Um, you don't get a two and a half month sabbatical, right? So uh, uh, so the fire you. Yeah. Three months. Three months. Okay. <laughs> so um, the, so this is when you start to see uh, this collective action. Uh, and, and labor, I mean, this is before Karl Marx, right? So this is in the 1820s and 30s. But there's a radical critique. I mean, they understand and see themselves as a class, a contradistinction to the, the owners of production. So this is before Marx even writes the manifesto or, or anything else. Yet what you have is this rhetoric of, of, of uh, production. And workers often refer to themselves as producers. There's this producer's ideology that's going to remain consistent throughout the 19th century. We produce good things. We produce food. We make it possible for you to eat. We grow crops. We make furniture. We, we make it possible for all of you to live. We are the producers. We create the stuff uh, of which life uh, is on which life is dependent. So there's this producer's ideology, right? And we should be rewarded for the fruits of our labor. Basically, uh, Marx would later call this the labor theory of value. We create value. What, create, what creates the value in these sunglasses? Is it the, the plastic, which is like two cents? Is it the, the metal frames? No. It's the labor involved in putting these things together. So I need to thank some eight-year-old kid in Bangladesh for these, I'm sure. Um, that's what, what creates value. And that's how workers says, like, we create all this wealth. You guys just sit around and you make profits, right? You have this initial investment. And those investments, as I said before, are often um, uh, subsidized by the state. There's no free market. There's no private enterprise. That, you know, that Tea Party quote I read you, getting back to the, the way the founders established the country, keeping government out of business, that was never the case. And you see that even more in, in factory work and in manufacturing than you do in agriculture. There's a, a, and if you look at that report on manufacturers, you'll see that. What Hamilton did was established the groundwork for an industrial country. He said, we need to become an industrial power. So in 1791, Hamilton's a brilliant, far-sighted guy. In 1791, Hamilton's talking about um, subsidies. He calls them uh, bounties, I believe. Um, he's talking about tariffs. Uh, the, the point for tariffs is to protect northern manufacturing. You know what protective tariff is? If, if you're producing goods, let's say you're producing textiles, you can't compete against the British textile industry because it's so far advanced. You know, it's, it's just way ahead. So textiles coming in from Britain are going to cost less than textiles made in Massachusetts. So as a consumer, what would you buy? You buy the British stuff, right? So how do I promote domestic manufacturing? What do I do? I make the imports too expensive, so I levy really heavy tariffs. Tariffs are taxes on trades. So now, right, you're, you're, you're a British textile maker, and your stuff used to be a lot cheaper than hers. She's a, a Massachusetts textile maker. But now I put like this 300% tax tariff on your goods. So her stuff is substantially cheaper now. So which one are you going to buy? You're going to buy the cheap stuff, right? Okay. So, uh, 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 so what this does now, what does this mean for the consumer? All right, and, and ideally, in this competitive market system, you would each be competing against one another for the, to create the lowest price, the best product, the lowest price, right? That's the theory. It's never been the case. Nobody ever. Businessmen hate competition. Competition is the worst thing you can have as a businessman, right? I mean, do you want a Starbucks moving next to you if you own a coffee shop? Of course not, right? So they hate, they hate competition. So, um, so if I protect your, your businesses against him, what incentive do you have to keep your prices at the lowest rate possible? You really don't. So you can raise your prices up because they're protected, right? Now, we're mostly talking, we're not talking about Starbucks or The Gap, we're talking about things like tools. So as a farmer, you know, as a farmer, you need to buy manufactured tools. You need to buy uh, shovels and hoes and things like that, which are going to be probably made out of iron, which is going to be made in the north. So the price of your goods is actually going to be higher because I'm protecting them. So as consumers, how do these protective tariffs affect you? You're paying higher wages, yeah. all right? So who's, who's this benefiting? Who's, who's it benefiting? He's protective tariffs. Who's it benefiting? Uh, protecting her, yeah. the, the manufacturer, the, the, the factory owner. 
the workers, not really, what's your incentive to pay your workers well? Do you have an incentive to pay your workers well? No, because there's a reserve army of the unemployed out there. So if, if, if she gets mouthy with you and wants higher wages, you just fire her. And she's gone by noon, and then you bring somebody else in, right? All right, so, so this is going to become the impetus for uh, the first uh, uh, attempts at, at, at labor, labor organization. You also have a lot of kind of um, spontaneous labor activism. Workers will just go on strike. Uh, uh, even more than that, they'll kind of jimmy rig the, the word process. One thing that you'll often find, and historians and anthropologists, people like to make a lot out of this. I, I don't so much is um, kind of cultural resistance. Uh, you know, slaves will, uh, they'll like urinate in the soup and then serve it to the, the masters, you know, and, he, he, he. and workers will do the same thing. They'll monkey wrench the system. They'll kind of screw up the plant, that kind of thing, you know, you know, invert. I mean, uh, slaves will do the same thing. You like, uh, you break, uh, you know, a plow or something like that. And then uh, you pretend you don't know how to fix it. It's called putting on old massa. And so in the meantime, you know, these guys, the overseers are, are fixing it and they're complaining about how stupid the slaves are while the slaves are in a tree, under a tree, um, you know, in the shade, just kind of relaxing. And, and the same thing will happen in factory life. So that's one form of resistance is this, you know, acting stupid and monkey wrenching the system. But we're more concerned with, you know, kind of protest and radical movements. And you start to see that, but it's really hard to organize first because you don't have economic power and there's, there's nothing to leverage unless you're a skilled worker. And the number of skilled workers isn't that great, and they tend to be associated with guilds. I mean, occasionally you'll see a strike, but generally they're paid well. They're, they're treated fairly well. I mean, uh, uh, an unskilled worker, somebody working in a textile mill, might make somewhere around $300 a year. And these are ballpark numbers. I don't have the precise numbers with me. A skilled worker could make $1,000 to $1,200 a year. So for a thousand, with $1,200 a year, you could you know, rent a nice house. Your wife may or may not have to work. But if you're a worker making 300 a year, everyone in the family, including the kids as young as age eight, are out there working too. There are eight-year-olds working in the textile mills. You know, they're really good because they have little fingers and they can do certain tasks. They're good in the mines because they're little and they can get through the holes and, you know, they're like the canaries in the coal mine and things like that. So everybody works out of economic necessity. Now this is going to lead, like I said, to labor organization. Uh, workers will try to organize collectively within their particular trade, whether textile mills, for instance, uh, and then they'll try to organize across those trade lines. So the textile workers might try to organize with the people working in the, the iron factories or so forth. And that's virtually impossible. Um, it's difficult to get class solidarity. Even today, it's difficult to get class solidarity. You rarely see in American history any successful uh, large-scale movements. I mean, national strikes are fairly common in a lot of industrialized countries. In the U.S., um, we'll, we'll talk about wine in particular, but that, they're harder to come by. You know these kinds of actions, which is why the stuff going on today, especially with the Occupy movement, which which uh, we're going to have somebody talk about later, is, is really quite uh, impressive because it's it's occurring um, in so many different places, and um, they've staged national actions, which have come off you know fairly successful, not strikes or anything like that, but for instance, asking people to leave their banks and go to credit unions or alternative financial institutions, and already something like six billion dollars in capital has moved out of banks into. Now, I mean, that may seem like a lot of money. You know, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money, uh, the old saying goes. Um, you know, it's, it's for the banks, it's not. But, but on the other hand, considering what's happened in, the, in, in areas like that before, it's, it's, it's incredibly significant. All right? So what you have then is this, um, like I said, the civil war industrialization and proletarianization. And that's really going to be um, the genesis of large-scale action. Now, after the civil war, you, you really start to see protest and, and radicalism on a much larger scale. And in fact, from the 1870s onward through, for about a half century really, you're gonna see the most sustained and intense period of class struggle and violence, class violence in the United States. It's something that we don't really talk much about. After 1920, after World War I and the Red Scare, you don't have that same level of class violence. You still have organization. In the 1930s, it was, a, it was an incredibly uh, aggressive period for that sit-down strikes, and during the Depression, of course, people are living, you know, truly uh, on the margin. But from the 1870s to the World War I era, what you see is on a sustained basis, strikes and protests and armed uprisings and the state coming out on a, on a, on a regular basis, all right? I want to talk just a little bit about the kind of context of it, and you should start reading the textbook now. 
along with bread and roses. What I'll probably do is, um, over break, I'll probably send you some kind of a, a question to answer based on this week's lectures and the Bread and Roses book, and then you can bring it in the, the week after New Year's when we can start meeting again. So make sure you do the reading and read the, read the, the textbook, American Power, American People, because that'll give you the context for all this. That's why I wrote it. And I wrote the thing because it fits in the, with the way I teach, so I don't have to go try to find somebody else's textbook, which generally I don't like. All right. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of the context. Uh, uh, one of the, the main root causes of the Civil War, uh, anybody ever see The Simpsons when Apu's trying to become a citizen and they ask him about what are the causes of when he goes off and he tries to launch, and what is Apu, what do they tell Apu? Say Just say slavery, right? <laughs> um, and I don't want to sound like one of those wing, wing that sons of the Confederacy people, but I mean, slavery is obviously crucial. You know, it's huge. You can't in any way dismiss that. But one of the root causes of it is actually the question, what kind of country is the United States going to become? In the, in the antebellum period, you have two, two separate societies. I mean, it's the United States of America, but it might as well be two different places. And it really is two different places. Because the North and the South are fundamentally different societies. They might be American, but actually Southerners would identify themselves as Southern more than they would American anyway. So just kind of cultural thing. Slavery is a crucial part of that. Slavery, the institution of slavery is a huge part of, of the Southern legacy of, of Southern culture. But it's also a labor system, and that's one thing that's really crucial to remember. You know, to look at slavery, not just as this you know, really profane human institution, but as a labor system. And, and slavery as a labor system um, is fundamentally different than the free labor system in the North, which is what I just explained. If you look at the great powers in the early 1800s, which countries have industrialized and become powerful and wealthy? The British obviously have, the, the French, Germany, Spain and, and the Netherlands to some extent, right? Not as much. What do they all have in common? What kind of systems? What kind of economic systems have they developed? Well, the, the global system is mercantile, but they're actually transitioning out of that into what? When does Britain become a capitalist power? When it, Industrial Revolution, right? So industrialization is the key to this kind of next step, this transformative uh, uh, step toward kind of uh, wealth and, 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 and hegemony and power, right? The United States is on that path because of uh, government subsidization of, of industry. But where is that occurring in the United States prior to the Civil War? In the North. It's very specific to essentially the Eastern Seaboard of New York and kind of this mid the Middle States, right? The South is still, in fact, what? The South is still agricultural. And with its labor system, the South actually resembles what kind of system that occurred, you should know this probably in medieval times. What's, what's the dominant labor system they both? So it's feudalism. The South actually, in, in many ways, represents these kind of feudal ideas where um, most of the, the, the wealth it comes out of land. I, I mentioned that. Uh, in the South, uh, uh, wealth equals land. The more land you have, the more property you have, the more slaves you have. I mean, if you have slaves and land, you're very wealthy. In the North, what equals wealth? What makes one wealthy in the North? Doesn't have doesn't have slaves. Hmm? Well, but even more than that, what, what, that translates into what? The capital. Capital. And, and, and it's also worth mentioning here. What's capital? If I pull a 20 out of my wallet, um, is that capital? But if I go buy a bagel with it, is that capital? Does it have to be invested? Yeah. No, so I'm saying, so a 20, a 20 in my pocket that I use to go buy a bagel is, is not capital, it's not, right? It's not enriching you. Yeah, so capital is, is money that's used to reproduce itself. It, it's, 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 it's fertilized, and then it becomes um, reproductive. So capital is money you invest to, to create some kind of business, which will produce a good, uh, which will be sold at a profit, and then what do you do with those profits? You take them back and reinvest them. So you continue this kind of organic process, according to Adam Smith and others, where you keep, uh, Clinton used to always say, growing the economy. And I hate that phrase, but you keep growing the economy, right? Um, and uh, um, in so doing, you enlarge yourself, you expand, and you, you become uh, very wealthy. That's capital, all right? In the South, it's kind of a pre-capitalist system. I mean, these guys actually go out there, merchants and so forth. But... Um, what they'll generally do is produce goods based on this, the free labor, the slave labor of others, and they'll, they'll have land, all right? 
and some of them will expand their land holdings. And, you know, there's actually a debate as to whether slavery and the agriculture system was capitalist or not. And, I mean, just, you know, you can argue that either way. There's some incredibly sharp people who will, will make that claim. I, I still would say that capitalism has to uh, require industrialization, uh, especially because of the labor system. Slavery is in no way capitalist. Slavery cannot be capitalist. Capitalists understand that, right? So it's better to rent labor than it is to buy it. You pay them to work 12 hours a day, and then you pay them to leave. And then you have no obligations whatsoever. Yeah, I used the Charlie Sheen line already. So, um, so you have no obligations whatsoever at that point, whereas with slavery, they're, they're ongoing and they're, and they're concurrent. So industrialism, so, so then what you have are these two fundamentally different societies. And, and one of the real problems in the Civil War prior to the Civil War is what is the question, what kind of society is the United States going to be? It can't continue to have this, this division, right? It's a political division, and it's also a, a political economic division. And the South, I think, justifiably is upset because the government has been making decisions that, that damage its interest. Tariffs, for instance. Uh, 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 if the United States institutes heavy tariffs against British textile manufacturers, right, what do the British do? Do they just say, oh, well, we got to pay it? What are they going to do? They're going to go, well, but I mean, this is, that, this is their colony. This is a market, I mean, it's not a colony anymore, but it's an economic partner. It's an important economic partner, and they need the American market. You could go elsewhere, but what else can you do? I mean, if, if you smack me, what do I do? I smack back. So how does Britain smack back? They increase their tariffs. Now, what goods from the United States are going to Britain that can be taxed? text of uh, agriculture, right? So my policies are benefiting you as a manufacturer. You're a farmer. What do you think of them? You're a southern farmer. What do you think of the tariffs? Anybody know what they call that? The, the southerners had a particular name for the tariff of 1828. Anybody ever hear the tariff of? Anybody ever hear that phrase? Scott. The tariff of abominations. Now, what's an abomination? What's an abomination? Justin Bieber, okay. <laughs> What's an abomination? Roseanne Barr singing. That's, that's abominable. Something, unholy. something bad, something unholy. It's really bad, right? Um, I, I promise to clean. This is usually where I make a joke about my ex-wife, but I've tried to promise to clean up my ass. So. Uh, it's something really bad. So the tariff of 1828 is abominable. I mean, Southerners begin to talk about secession. In 1828, are they talking about slavery? No. The South Carolina legislature actually votes to consider secession in 1820 over a tariff. The, the, the slavery issue never emerges. So uh, at the fulcrum of this division between the North and South are these economic policies. Is the future of what kind of economic system they're going to have. Northerners are going to suggest that you can't have a great country if you continue to have half of this country with this feudal system with slave labor. And they're essentially right. I mean, if you look at the, the laws of economic history, or if you just look at basically the way economic history developed, that's true. No country, I mean, if you look at the great powers, they essentially follow fairly similar patterns. They industrialize, they have heavy state subsidization, heavy state support, and they favor industry over farming. They give priority to banks and manufacturers. And that's what's happening, but not in the South. If you're a banker, right, and, and you have somebody who comes to you who wants a significant loan to build textile mills, and somebody else who comes to you who wants a significant loan to buy more land and more slaves. Who are you going to loan money to? The mills, the factories. It's a safer investment, and the return is going to be so much greater, right? Because, for one thing, your labor is a lot cheaper. Your labor is actually cheaper. If I pay a bunch of people a buck a day, I'm way better off than investing. Uh, I mean, slave, slaves, considered as cattle property, on the eve of the Civil War, uh, were valued at two billion dollars, two billion dollars in human property, uh, which is you know a significant amount of money. This is an 1860 dollars, you know who knows what that would be in contemporary times. Um, so for one thing, uh, uh, labor is is easier in a, in a wage system, right? Um, and again, this is no endorsement or in any way trying to suggest that slavery was in any kind of way a positive system. It obviously was and it was inhuman. Um, the point is, from an economic standpoint, there was a, a clear case to be made that it was actually a more profitable and better system to create uh, industrialization. So in, in, to, a, to a significant degree, 
degree, the, the war uh, between the states was, was based on this question of what kind of society are we going to become. Now, central to that is the question of, of labor and slavery, absolutely. But it wasn't a moral issue. I mean, there wasn't this kind of moral crusade, we have to eliminate slavery because it's immoral. Even most abolitionists were racist. Abraham Lincoln did not consider the races equal. Lincoln trafficked in the typical stereotypes he called blacks monkeys. He thought blacks were inferior. He didn't want whites and blacks interacting. Uh, Lincoln sent agents into Central America to try to find places where blacks could be colonized. Uh, so um, there's not this, it's not a moral crusade. Most people don't feel that way. Even abolitionists don't feel that way. Frederick Douglass, some of that, that's obviously uh, uh, you know, an exception. Um, so what you have then is this kind of real fundamental issue of, of what kind of society you're going to become. And the industrials win. I mean, the, the, the short you know, version of it is that with the Civil War comes the try for industrial capitalism. And if you want to know why the North won, why the Union won, I, can, I have a bunch of charts I could show to you where in terms of industrial output, in terms of railroad mileage, in terms of capital, in terms of land, even um, the North overwhelms the South. The Union overwhelms the Confederacy. It has, I forget, how many more banks and how much more capital and things like that. So industrialization means you can build, uh, you can build weapons, you can make guns, you can, you have trains to get your troops move, movement better, you have better battlefield medicine. In all of these ways, the North was was far superior. All right, with industrialization then comes a new form of labor, proletarianization. Um, this is kind of the large scale working class proletariat. Is is, is it's the term that Marx kind of used, but it, it's not necessarily a Marxist term. This is the term for a large-scale industrial working class. It tends to be more unskilled. Um, it tends to uh, its relations to the production are as producers, as as people who make goods, but don't have skills and aren't um, really rewarded. And I mean, they're not owners. They're not rewarded in that way. I mean, farmer. Most farmers were subsistence farmers, so you own your own land and you grew stuff for yourself. Workers don't have that relationship to their work process. So proletarianization, and there had been working class people before. There had always been classes. People always knew. Like I said, you don't have to look in the mirror and say, I'm poor. People knew it. They didn't need a, an official certificate to say, by the way, you're poor. They knew it. Uh, Daniel Shays knew he was poor. Bacon and his followers, the Paxton, the Whiskey Rebellion. All those farmers, all those people, all those workers knew they were poor. The workers who went on, on strike in Philadelphia and the courts ruled against them because they were conspiring to achieve better wages, right? They, they knew they were poor. Proletarianization creates a large-scale consciousness of people who now see themselves as part of this larger working class. Um, it's a process that in the United States has always been sketchy and uneven. Uh, and, and it's easy today, you know, especially if you look, listen to the media rhetoric, to say everybody's middle class. I mean, if you listen to Barack Obama during the debates in 2008, everybody's middle class. <coughs> uh, even today, that's generally like the, the uh, people on the right generally don't talk about issues like that at all. And among people who are liberals, they generally seek, try to see us. Everybody's middle class, right? So both Bill Gates and you guys are middle class, right? Everybody's middle class. So there's not really this consciousness, this sense of people as a proletariat. Now, that may be changing if you saw what happened like in Wisconsin, like about a year ago in Ohio. I mean, people are starting to kind of see themselves as part of this distinct and collective workforce, you know. But this, this isn't a problem in the early period of industrialization. Workers see themselves as, as proletariat. And there's this process by which they lose their uh, uh, identities. <clears throat> I mean, many people were, were just farmers, and a lot of people were craftsmen. They were artisans. So, I mean, the early 18th, early 19th century, 1800, 1810, by and large, in this room where there are about 30 people, the majority of you, the big majority of you, would have been farmers. You would have simply, you know, had land and tried to raise crops enough to feed your families. Some of you would have been artisans. You would have a skill. You might have made shoes. Shoemakers, there's a lot of studies on shoemakers. So if you were a shoemaker, your work process was very much self-identified. You, you had a little shed in your backyard, 10 by 10. You and your wife and the family and maybe uh, an apprentice would work in that shed. And somebody would come in and order a pair of shoes. You would make it. You would buy the product. You would buy the leather. You would buy the goods. And you know your wife might keep the books or something like that. And, and you would make that pair of shoes. It would be customized, right? And, um, you know, you come in. It, you'd be a few days. If you didn't feel like work, you didn't work. If you wanted to go out and, you know, hit the keg at lunch, you could do that and fall asleep. People rarely worked on Mondays because they were so hungover from the previous weekend. They called it St. Monday 
Um, I'm a hard-working fellow, but I ain't working on a Monday. Uh, and they would, you know, just be drunk and hungover, so they would celebrate St. Monday, which means you'd come in and you'd sweep the floor and take a nap or something like that. Um, that changes. You can't do that anymore. Uh, pretty soon, middlemen come in, and they'll say, instead of making shoes individually, give me 20 pairs of shoes of different sizes, and I'm going to go out and sell them, all right? And then pretty soon, middlemen say, hey, I don't even need you. So they create a piecework system where they'll especially get young women, <coughs> and they'll pay them to do one part of the system. So I might bring, like, leather over to your house to do a certain part. I might bring strings. You might punch the holes in. Who knows, right? And then we put the shoe together. And then they think, well, I don't even need that anymore. Let me build a factory and centralize everything. So what happens to that? You, you used to have a skill. You can make shoes, right? And, but it would take you a few days, and it would be somewhat costly. Can you compete against this new labor process? No, you can't, right? So you're probably going to be run out of business. And what's the, the irony? A generation later, you who once had your own very thriving shoe shop, shoemaker shop, now what are you doing? You're working in the factory for somebody else, all right? And this is part of that proletarianization process. So instead of having farmers and artisans, you now have people who are working within this factory system working for someone else, all right? Now this is going to explode in the, in the 1870s. The Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War created great economic problems. Much of the war was financed with, with paper money, with greenbacks, which meant that after the war you had serious uh, economic cycles. You had rampant inflation and then the, the economy would deflate. You had a serious problem with overproduction. Too many goods were being produced because of the new technology, right? Now, what happens when, when there's too much uh, a supply? There's too much of something. What does that do? What's that? What's the market? It'll glut the market, and, and what will that do? What will it do to prices? Because prices prices are, low. are low. That's good, isn't it? I mean, if you know, look at look at what's happened in computers. I mean, you know, you can buy a laptop now for what three, four hundred bucks, a decent laptop, right? And it used to be three, four thousand, right? Healthcare has gone the other direction, right? But uh, um, so that's good, isn't it? What could be bad? about a glutted market and overproduction and lower prices? Well, for the producers, it's a real problem, right? So what you have after the Civil War is this persistent problem of currency, wild currency fluctuations because of the, the presence of paper money in the system and overproduction. Ultimately, what that's going to lead to, which is far more problematic than inflation, is actually deflation, which is kind of really what, what the U.S. is dealing with right now. It's, it's actually far closer to a deflationary crisis, which is much harder to get out of than an inflationary uh, crisis, right? So that's what's occurring. And within that process, it's not hard for people to see themselves as part of this, this proletariat. So what you have in the aftermath of the Civil War is an industrialized country with an industrial working class, all right? Um, let me stop there. We'll take a few minutes. We'll set up, and then I want to introduce our speakers. One other thing. Um, I don't take attendance in here, so I can't say this is mandatory, but I'm going to be in here Thursday because I'd like to kind of catch up and get a lot of stuff done so that the next two weeks we can spend a lot of time doing kind of the more contemporary things. So I'm going to be here Thursday, not tomorrow. Tomorrow you can sleep in. I'm going to be here Thursday, though. I don't take attendance, but I'd like to see you here, okay? And I'll remind, I'll remind you all, send out an email, put on the Facebook page, too, all right? So just take five, and then we'll get organized here and get, get uh, things going.